one of my favorite jobs had to be working at the County Historical Museum. Down in the basement, they had everything from uh, glass plate negatives, photographs of people taken a uh, hundred years ago, to coroner's reports. Uh, one I remember telling you about listed the uh, cause of death as pistol ball through heart, a cowboy killed on Quested Grade in the 1850s. Well, they have cool stuff on exhibit, too. Uh, this is the original lamp from the Port San Luis Lighthouse. And a real grandy history. The patriarch of the Akeda family, Kazuo Akeda, was a famous catcher. He played for Cal Poly with his brother. Uh, in fact, he's in the Nisei Baseball Hall of Fame, and they have his catcher's bit on display. They have something else that's kind of different. Uh, the Truesdale family is uh, still pretty prominent in San Luis Obispo. And this is a beautiful wreath that the family made. Now, the thing you and I might find a little bit different about this beautiful wreath is that it's completely made out of human hair. And some of those Truesdales were no longer living when they contributed their hair to this hair wreath. That was something that was pretty common in Victorian times. And mourning customs in Victorian times reveal an awful lot about the status of women during La Belle Epoque. One additional point I need to make about these Victorian mourning customs. Widow's dresses were commonly made out of crepe, which is a highly flammable material. Now, this is a time when homes are lit by gas jets. So every so once in a while, tragically, a Victorian widow would die because she was on fire and thus leave her children orphans. So, for the second part of the lesson, there's a series of questions. What was expected of Victorian women? And more than anything, we're talking about women of the new middle class. And here's Victoria on the day of her wedding to Prince Albert, a German prince who brought, among other things, the, uh, the Christmas tree to the English-speaking world. That was a German custom. Now, first of all, reverse role models what not to be. But don't be Katy Perry at halftime. Also, for goodness sake, do not be what was called a fallen woman. It's a very moralistic painting. This is the family, and you see the father opening the door and pointing to the cold, dark, wintry night outside. Well, that young woman is his daughter. And the baby that she's holding is his grandchild. Why would he be kicking them out? Well, if this is a moralistic painting, it needs a message. And the message here is that young woman wasn't married when she had that baby. That's totally unacceptable. You are not to get pregnant. You're not to be what Victorians politely refer to as a fallen woman, a prostitute, invariably in very... Uh, tacky Victorian novels, a young woman who pursued this line of business wound up uh, drowning in the Thames. Because we know what happened to very poor women in London in 1888. Another type not to be 
This is Emmeline Pankhurst. She's a suffragist. Suffragists were women who campaigned for the right to vote in Lake Victorian England. And here she is being arrested because she's been demonstrating for the suffrage in front of Buckingham Palace, no less. And as we'll see, suffragists were not shy about uh, dynamiting buildings, uh, setting fires, and on one occasion even getting into a massive fistfight with members of parliament. When the suffragists went on hunger strike in British jails, the uh, British government wasn't about to let them die, so they were force-fed. A rubber tube was run down their throat into their stomach, and something like cream of wheat was pumped into their stomachs. It was horrific. Now, if you're not to be uh, an unwed mother, a fallen woman, or a suffragist, what is the proper role? Well, it's a term we mentioned before. It's this philosophy that historians call the cult of domesticity. And it's the idea, again, that a woman's highest aspiration, and uh, for the most part, her only aspiration, should be that of a wife and mother. And again, let me reiterate, uh, I do not find anything wrong with that role. It's the most important role in our society. But what you and I might find distasteful is that that was pretty much the only role open to women during La Belle Epoque. And here is the ideal Victorian bride. And I want you to study this picture and think about the message this image sends to young women. What kind of person is the ideal bride supposed to be? Britain would have its first female prime minister in the 1970s, 1980s. Her name is Margaret Thatcher. Is this young woman going to run for political office? Now, there was also a real-life ideal, and this was the eldest daughter of Queen Victoria, also named Victoria. And the eldest daughter is referred to as the Crown Princess. And here she is, a real-life, and she's quite pretty, role model for young women, uh, on the day of her marriage to a German prince. Unfortunately, the result of this marriage would be uh, a son who would become the emperor or kaiser of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II. And in 1914, Wilhelm's Germany and England would go to war against each other. And this is a man who kept a barber solely to take care of the imperial mustache. And that's quite a mustache. Victoria once said, what Willie needs, that was her nickname for Kaiser Wilhelm, what Willie needs is a darn good spanking. She said this when he was 40. Do we have a model bride today? You bet we do. And yes, I think she is lovely. But that's beside the point. Once married, the proper function of a wife was to give her husband unconditional emotional and psychological support. He was out there struggling for the daily bread, like the people in a Richard Corey poem by Edward Arlington Robinson. Uh, women were to be the pillar, the rock for their men and provide them a place of refuge from that Darwinian world outside. The home was to be a place of peace and comfort. And I want you to look at these photographs. And I, again, I think uh, images can be extremely powerful. They can communicate without words. And I think they back up that idea of the wife as the helpmate. It's almost as if she weren't there, the old fellow would fall over. Well, if the ideal bride was uh, Crown Princess Victoria, the ideal family was her mother's family. This is Queen Victoria's family, five of nine so far. That's her husband, the German Prince Albert. Here's a 
magazine illustration of them a, a little bit earlier on uh, with mummy and duckies. Don't have corgis yet. Corgis will come along a little bit later. And my gosh, look what happened. This is the next generation. Queen Victoria <clears throat> kind of exploded. To her left uh, is Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. You see the young couple uh, over her right shoulder, but to your left? The Tsar and Tsarina of Russia, Anastasia's mom and dad. The upper right, just below the gent, the extreme upper right, is the future King Edward VII of England. He's the one I can't forgive because he cheated on his queen, Alexandra of Denmark, who I think was a peach. Well, uh, the real story was, but things weren't quite so ideal. Victoria hated being pregnant. Who wouldn't? I don't blame her for that. She hated babies, but she had nine. And she was um, indifferent and even cruel to the future King Edward VII. It doesn't surprise me that he had a series of affairs. As an amateur Freudian, I would say he was uh, seeking female love that he never got from mum. And then that next generation, generation of grandchildren, look at the crowned heads. Queen Sophia of Greece, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, Queen Maud of Norway, King George V of England. He was the father in the King's Speech, if you saw that movie. And then the very lovely Queen Marie of Romania. And the bottom right-hand corner, the ill-fated Tsarina uh, or Empress Alexandra of Russia. So you may hear the term next chapter, uh, Grandmother of Europe, and they're talking about Queen Victoria. And sadly, a family quarrel in 1914 would have tremendous implications. It would be a turning point in history. And another turning point would be a genetic defect that Victoria carried in her DNA. It had to do with a condition called hemophilia. In reality, most urban Europeans did not have nine bouncing babies. As McKay will note, families get smaller. For one thing, city life is expensive, and you can't afford nine children. Uh, for another thing, living space is limited. Nine children in an urban apartment it gets awfully crowded. And finally, you don't need large families anymore to uh, help bring in the crops, as was a rural tradition. So families get smaller. Instead of nine children, three or four becomes the norm. Now, I said urban life was expensive. It was still affordable for this new middle class that we're reading about. And one thing that made it affordable was the Industrial Revolution. Thanks to mass-produced machine-made nails like these and standardized lumber in standardized sizes, two-by-fours and so on, it's much cheaper to construct houses than it had been before. Uh, home prices come down, and so uh, city living is within reach of most middle-class couples. Also, the stuff that goes in those homes the price of that comes down, too, because furnishing, stoves, things like that, are also mass-produced. So they, too, become cheaper. And some folks uh, shop through the mail-order catalogs, especially middle-class families who don't live in big cities. I love looking at these old catalogs, especially the prices. Here's a cast-iron stove, thirteen ninety-five, such a deal. Comfort for ladies, a Prince of Wales chair, and a Woolsey easy chair. I don't think I'd want a chair named after Cardinal Woolsey. Electric washing machines, and uh, what laundry day was like for women before electricity was abominable. It took all day, and most country women looked like question marks by the time they were 30 uh, from bending over the wash tub. This was a great invention. Why not have your own parlor piano? Ninety-eight fifty. You can even buy your own tombstone. I kind of like that uh, fourteen ninety-eight model, the lower right. My name B 
big at the top of Gridery. In fact, you could even buy a house. Now, this was uh, my doctor's office when I was a little boy. It's a pediatrician's office today on Traffic Way. And that's a house that was ordered out of the Sears catalog. It came here prefabricated, was assembled on site. It's still there today. Now, as to what's going on inside the home, there's a key innovator I want you to know. And she's actually an American. Her name is Catherine Beecher. Catherine came from a remarkable family, a uh, family of missionaries and preachers. Uh, there she is right there, and you can tell uh, she's not the looker among the sisters. And she's a leading proponent of this idea of the cult of domesticity. The most famous member of the family isn't Catherine. It's her sister Harriet, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, a novel that was so popular at 1860 was translated to Japanese among uh, some 50 other languages, and a novel that made Queen Victoria herself weep. But Catherine's contribution was inspired by her voyages at sea. Uh, the kitchens before Catherine Bishop were quite large, and uh, she decided inefficient. So what she did was to shrink the kitchen and to design it in a way so that everything was in arm's reach. I don't know about your house, but at my house, it's difficult for two people to work in the kitchen at the same time. Well, that's deliberate, and that's the impact of this very influential Victorian woman. Uh, she shrinks the kitchen again to make it more efficient. And the kitchen designed by Catherine Beecher kind of becomes symbolic of the role of white-collar middle-class women. Uh, they were once uh, in ancestral times. They worked in the fields beside their husbands. You know that women worked alongside their husbands early in the Industrial Revolution, in fact, alongside their children. But now the wife's mission is pretty much that of a full-time professional consumer. And if women had one substantial power during La Belle Epoque, during Victorian times, it was this. The typical middle-class husband on payday came home and immediately turned over his paycheck to his wife. She managed everything within the home, including the household budget. Well, the rights she didn't have tipped the scales. Women could not vote, of course. They had no property rights. Legally, women had the same legal status as children and the insane. And again, as we saw in looking at the records from the Old Bailey, London's criminal court last semester, women were frequently victims of domestic abuse. And just as images are symbolic of deeper trends in society. So fashion, and women's fashion during La Belle Epoque, is nothing short of hideous. And uh, we have other examples of what women sacrifice in the name of fashion. This Chinese woman, look at her feet. Nothing uglier to a Chinese gentleman in the 19th century than big feet. So women had their feet bound from the time they were infants until they kind of curled under. They could barely walk. They had kind of a swaying motion that I guess Chinese men found uh, irresistible. But I want you to think about what this tradition says and did about the power of women. We shouldn't be too smug. This is Betty Grable, pinup during World War II, and she's wearing high heels. Well, High heels would reach uh, extravagant stiletto lengths during the early 1960s, about the same time that Cadillac fins were so big. And this, too, in the name of fashion, accentuates a woman's calves. It also destroys her lower back. And the prime example during La Belle Epoque of 
uh, sacrificing your body in the name of fashion is the whalebone corset for that hourglass figure that men found so entrancing. The most famous of, example of that we have from popular culture comes from Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell's novel made into the classic movie. Here's Hattie McDaniel, the first black woman to win an Oscar, uh, cinching Scarlet, played, uh, of course, by Vivian Lee, into her whalebone corset. Scarlet had the smallest waist in her county, 17 inches. And for God's sake, she's being hitched into this god-awful thing just before a barbecue? Come on. How about sweatpants? This helps room to expand, especially if they're serving ribs. It got to the point that women so sought this desired hourglass kind of figure that some wealthy women, uh, just as some women have Botox today, actually had their lower ribs removed, uh, with the result that there were occasional fatalities. When that whalebone corset was cinched too tightly, it crushed internal organs. Women died. You may notice women faint a lot in those old movies. Well, you can't breathe with one of these stupid things on. What liberated women from the prison of the whalebone corset, believe it or not, was something called the safety bicycle. And if you've ever seen that bicycle with a big wheel outside of Irish bike shop, then you know why this particular bicycle was called a safety bicycle. It has coaster brakes just like bikes did uh, when you and I were little kids. Now, what's the big deal? Bicycling became as big a passion in Europe and America as boating was for Parisians. And one cannot ride a bicycle while wearing a whalebone corset. So this young woman is corsetless, and not only that, she's wearing culottes. Okay, so this new invention gives women freedom, and uh, they are now mobile, if not hostile. Look at what Susan B. Anthony says about the bicycle. To be honest, the safety bicycle and the woman thereupon scared the hell out of men. Ministers actually condemned bicycles as being agents of Satan. And here's a New Zealand bicycling club. Uh, men uh, rode along with these women because other men threw rocks at them. They were threatened by this newly liberated specter of a woman on her bicycle. Well, uh, the turning point for European and American women would tragically come with the First World War. With so many men fighting on the continent, and this being an industrial war that required massive amounts of factory labor. About a third of factory jobs in England, for example, and in the United States during World War II, for another example, was made up of women. And here, the women on the right are shell fillers at Artillery Shell Factory. And we'll learn later how incredibly dangerous that work was. Well, it was recognized after the war that the war could not have been waged without the labor of women. So it's not a coincidence that women in most of European countries and in the United States would finally get the suffrage in 1920 after World War I. They had earned it, according to men.